Je rappelle à ceux d'entre vous qui n'étaient pas présents lors de la première conférence la semaine dernière que le professeur Arato s'exprime en anglais, mais que vous pouvez poser vos questions en français, puisque nous consacrons un quart d'heure à poser des questions après la fin de sa, de sa conférence. Donc, euh, la conférence précédente, il nous avait présenté un cadre général d'analyse de ces transitions euh, constitutionnelles. Il va continuer à approfondir ce cadre général d'analyse, mais en introduisant aussi l'étude plus approfondie d'un certain nombre de case study. Et aujourd'hui, il nous parlera notamment, plus précisément, de euh, l'Afrique du Sud. Donc, je lui laisse euh, la parole. Well, thank you very much. Uh, um, Professor Rosenvallon follows a little the original outline. Uh, what uh, certainly I did last time uh, uh, is, is, is what he says. But uh, uh, today I would like, like to actually present the, the conception systematically with ultimately a South African reference. But I won't talk about the case uh, uh, in detail. It's, during my fourth lecture, actually, I wanted to speak about uh, Uh, specific cases, uh, uh, including uh, um, not just South Africa, but also talking uh, about uh, uh, more recent uh, uh, cases in, uh, in Turkey, Hungary, and in the Arab world. Uh, so it's the fourth lecture that is really the most, case, the most empirical, most case-oriented. Um, the third lecture will focus on social science theories and their critiques. Uh, And this lecture is an attempt to present a systematic uh, a version, uh, both from uh, structural and normative uh, points of view, uh, of, uh, of my conception, which I try to present in terms of uh, uh, history of ideas, uh, revolutionary ideas, uh, um, uh, last time. So let me launch into the actual text. Uh, I apologize again for uh, having such poor French that I cannot do it in French. But it is you who raised that standard so high that no foreigners, really very few foreigners, can uh, actually uh, satisfy it. In Germany, I can speak in German. And uh, in France, I'm afraid uh, uh, to even attempt that. Uh, so it will have to be in English. Um, so uh, uh, the title is Conventions, Constituent Assemblies, and Roundtables. Uh, last week, I argued that the combination of three modern concepts, namely sovereignty, the people, and the constituent power, pouvoir constituant, in the process of revolutionary constitution making, intensifies the authoritarian propensity of revolutions, their elective affinity, Wahlverwandtschaft, to dictatorship, already linked to ideas of total rupture, as well as the fact factual processes of civil war and internal coup. Merci beaucoup. Uh, I propose this argument in context of the history of the two great democratic revolutions, their forms of constitution making, and their relevant modes of theoretical justification and self-reflection. I maintained that the vision of the democratic revolution was antinomic, or revolutions was antinomic, suspended between notions of popular sovereignty seeking political embodiment and an idea of the democratic regime excluding organ sovereignty or the occupation of the place of the king by any instance. I also argued that both in France and America, theories of constitution making were linked to popular sovereignty, but that the authoritarian consequences of this were reduced in the American practice because of federalism that helped to consolidate a model of double differentiation between constituent and legislative powers. But given notions of popular sovereignty, Even the American double differentiation was open to the specter, if not of dictatorship, then the duality of power. Finally, I tried to show that it was in the French Revolution that, given the impossibility of adopting American double differentiation, Sayez and Condorcet anticipated a third alternative conception. In theory, that implied a multi-stage, multi-actor constitution-making method that pointed beyond the fiction of, of sovereign incarnation, a method that remained only a proposal in France at the time. Today, my theme will be this post-sovereign, post-organ sovereign, 
multi-stage method, as it has now emerged in, the practice, uh, in practice in the 1970s and late 80s in Spain and Central Europe, and was finally crystallized in its most advanced form in South Africa. I think this method or model or paradigm can be grasped as an ideal type, composed of two great stages, with a democratic election between them, involving the making of two constitutions, and with three main institutional agents, a multi-party negotiating forum or round table, a constitutional assembly, and a constitutional court. I will call it the round table after its most characteristic institution and post-sovereign or post-organ sovereign according to its deepest theoretical impulse. Among forms of, cons of democratic constitution making, I believe it is the normatively distinguished type that allows us to understand the meaning and the deficiencies of the forerunners. In this presentation, I will argue that the round table is an authentic democratic form of constitution making to be placed side by side with the convention pioneered in the United States and the constituent assembly made classical if not actually invented in France. I will argue that from a democratic point of view, and not only often strategically, it is superior to these earlier forms. I will claim that representing the constitution making dimension of a specific type of radical transformation it allows us to think beyond the conservative logic of reform and the authoritarian logic of revolution. So history of forms, convention, constituent assembly, and round table. In order to better understand the forms of democratic constitution making, it may, it may help to classify them along types of political transformations, on the board there, of which they are always key dimensions. Since there are empirically speaking more than two main forms of change, and also distinct types of constitution making, this classification cannot be done around a simple reform-revolution dichotomy. Hans Kelsen defined reform and revolution according to the options of legal continuity and discontinuity, or more precisely, using or breaking with a, a system's own rule of change. This, however, meant, logically, that all significant change was either reform or revolution. Paradoxically, even total replacement of regimes would simply be reform as long as the initial system's rule of change was used. At the same time, even minor change would be defined as a revolution if the system's rule of change was violated. We cannot limit ourselves to this conception even if it is a useful starting point. If, unlike Kelsen and legal positivism, we distinguish legitimacy and legality, we are able to map out around the other axis of continuity and rupture four possibilities of transformation to which typologically four types of democratic change of constitutions correspond. Reform, namely legality and legitimacy both being continuous, would have its typical form of change according to the established rules of revision or amendment rules. Revolution, both legality and legitimacy being ruptured, as already in Pennsylvania during the American Revolution, then in France in 1789 and 1792, would be linked to sovereign constituent assemblies. These forms are fairly well known, though the concept of revolution in particular has been generally understood differently than here. The role of the popular factor has been stressed, though it is questionable whether many revolutions were made by anything more than minorities. There has also been a tendency to define revolution in normatively progressive terms, a temptation that I will avoid here. Thus, counter-revolutions are also revolutions as I understand them. On the other hand, while the presence of coups in revolution has been almost a historical constant, as against Hans Kelsen, I do not completely identify coups and revolutions in spite of their close relationship. More importantly, in the scheme offered here, I get two additional equally pure types. Continuous legitimacy with legal rupture to which the American convention form that presupposed Republican forms of government corresponds. Bruce Ackerman chose a useful name for this type, revolutionary reform. Finally, in the context of a full break or breakdown of legitimacy, but continuous legality, we get what I will call, somewhat misleadingly, regime change along, and along with it the round table form. The table, again, illustrates this idea. But it requires some commentary. First, as I show later, 
there can be a process that starts one way and turns into another. Several Latin American cases, like Argentina in 1949, and Venezuela more recently start as conventions, uh, according to the typology there, and wind up as plebiscitary coups or as sovereign constituent assemblies or their combination. Reform can fail and turn into roundtables, as in most of the relevant cases here, but it can also turn into revolution constituent processes, as in India and many other post-colonial cases. Second comment, classification cannot be absolutely neat because one major element can be missing from a form that nevertheless should still be classified with others that are largely similar. For example, the conventions of Massachusetts and New Hampshire, their actual prototypes for this, uh, were legally established, and so were some other, some Latin American cases. Conversely, there was a legal break in Nepal, whose still incomplete process in other respects belonged to the round table. Finally, the prototypic a post-sovereign case of Spain did not have a round table and its interim rules were established from above and confirmed by a referendum. So I go on to the next table, but I'm not discussing it just yet. Uh, here I will concentrate on the three democratic forms involving generally discontinuity in one of the two domains, having to do with original constitution making capable of producing new regimes. I will neglect coups and self-coups because I do not regard plebiscitary legi legitimation as democratic and will mention these only where they are the results of the failures of conventions and constituent assemblies. However, historical analysis cannot avoid also touching on the, modern of re on the model of reform. As already implied uncannily, the various forms tended to originate from one another. The convention form as finalized by the American Federal Convention, but the same is true actually in Massachusetts too, grew out of reform. As in the case of several state conventions, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, its project originally was only a large-scale reform of an existing system constitutionalized by a treaty, the Articles of Confederation. The framers, that eventu the framers and eventually the ratifying states violated that, violated that project and produced a much more radical change within an established structure of state legitimacy. The drafting convention that could only recommend to state ratifying conventions was the main instrument of legal breaks with a within a generally intact overall legal and institutional system. This convention was doubly differentiated from legislative and other powers. It exercised no other powers than constitution making with no other institution having constituent powers till the moment of ratification. Well, it may be an exaggeration to say that the constituent assembly, I think the other table is more helpful with this, grew simply out of the convention. This is more or less what directly happened in Pennsylvania in 1776, when the dual power of two assemblies, the convention and the regular legislature, could not be stabilized. The result was a sovereign constituent assembly, still under the name of convention, along with, the, with a radical democratic constitution. More importantly, for the future, the American model of the federal convention, though influential in France in 1789, had no chance in practice. This is Arnaud's uh, book, which, uh, which illustrates this uh, uh, very well. As I argued last time, important authors and leaders wrote on the American constitutions, including the convention form, and the most sophisticated even expressed their preference for double differentiation for electing an extraordinary convention for the sole purpose of constitution making with no other powers in the state. Under French conditions, this proved impossible. In 1789, because of the existence of the Society of Orders and the impossibility of preserving an estate assembly based on it. And in 1792, because of a second revolution that swept away the powers of the elected, of the elected legislative assembly. The practice produced constituent, sovereign constituent assemblies, and it is this practice that became canonical for democratic and radical theory, especially, I think, because the result in 1793 was a never instituted but still highly democratic constitution. But the association of the second such a body in French history, the Convention Nationale, with revolution dictatorship and the reign of terror, meant that others, mainly liberal Democrats, continued to look to the 1789 prototype, the, Assemb the Assemblée Constituante, with its liberal, if barely successful, 1791 constitution. 
Thus, the name constituent assembly, assembly constituant, survived. And the most important difference between the two forerunners, whether the constituent assembly should offer its product for popular ratification, remained forever unresolved. The roundtable form is generally the off offspring of two parents, the reformist and revolutionary one. Without many exceptions in most of the relevant historical contexts, an old regime in power does try, but it fails to enact successful comprehensive reforms on its own. Everywhere there is also a revolutionary or radical democratic scenario in the wings, demanding a democratic elected constituent assembly, rarely making clear how without taking power, it can answer Lenin's significant objection from 1905 that I referred to last time, namely that the old regime would still dominate such elections. The Hungarian Democratic Opposition rejected calling for a constituent assembly for this reason. I mentioned only parenthetically. In any case, for a variety of reasons, with the exception of Iran, revolutionary power has not been available from the mid-1970s to the 1990s, or better still remained a mere potentiality more feared apparently by the old regimes than trusted by its own possible agents who either did not believe the power existed or were wary of using it even if it was available. This was true in South Africa quite significantly because this country did have a powerful revolutionary movement. Yet the CODESA and the multi-party negotiating forum rounds and even the previous talks about talks emerged from a similar constellation as the other round tables. The impossibility for old regime actors to save their system through mere reform and the inability of opposition, even revolutionary movements, to carry out a revolution. The roundtable form, born of this strategic constellation, gives to reformers a negotiated first phase in which they could attain guarantees enshrined in an interim constitution. The very same form provides radical democratic forces with a freely elected constitutional I make a distinction between constituent and constitutional assemblies. South Africans did this. That unlike the American state ratifying conventions of 1787, 1788, gets to redraft the constitution proposed by unelected instances. The underlying form of change called regime change here may be said to be a synthesis of reform and revolution to the extent that formally at least the rules of change of the old system are used to produce, unlike reform, an entirely new one. This is expressed by mixed terms like the Spanish ruptura reforma or ruptura pactada, or Timothy Garton Ash's quite inelegant revolution with an F. The strategic reasons for moving from form to form are clear. Following the reformist process, namely the rules of the Articles of Confederation, could not have achieved a more centralized system many of the large American states wanted. They needed to break the rules and the doubly used institution of conventions, doubly used because the drafting convention and then the ratifying conventions associated with popular government legitimated these breaks. At the same time, it should be noted, anything like the revolutionary constituent assembly formula, known from the Pennsylvania prototype, but of course we know it better from France, would have been not only unacceptable to the majority of the delegates, Politically, the federal convention did not have the power to accomplish such radical self-conversion. The one related proposal by Governor Morris to have ratification of the draft only by an elected national convention was not even seconded by any other member of the convention. As to the French constituent assemblies, however attractive American presidents may have been to some of their leaders, the leading revolutionaries and constitutional experts had no wish to share power with aristocratic institutions of the past even temporarily. Even the king, left in place, was deprived of his veto over, I don't mean on, I don't mean in, but veto over the constitution to be made. But normative or theoretical justification was not missing in this case either. The move to an all-powerful constituent assembly was accomplished in 1789 in the name of a unitary notion of popular sovereignty embodied in a single assembly with the plenitude of power. In America, popular sovereignty played a role too, but in an antinomic form, with the notion of the people alternately understood in national and federal terms. Here, the notion of sovereignty embodied in a single instance, while present in theory, could not even be approximated in practice. As to the second French Revolution, 1792, 
It was the power of a popular revolution rooted in Paris that forced even moder moderate Republicans like Condorcet, committed to double differentiation, to accept the destruction of the freely elected legislature, again in the name of unitary popular sovereignty, but this time checked by the direct democracy of the referendum. Finally, from 1989 to 1990, from Poland to South Africa, it was the combination of the collapse of the legitimacy of the old regimes and the insufficient power of oppositions that led to the new formula with its first stage negotiated at round tables. Most oppositions would have preferred, and I know this uh, uh, biographically, uh, not to negotiate with previous oppressors, but for strategic reasons, they all had to. At the same time, many actors, especially in Central and East Europe, did not wish to adopt any revolutionary perspective given the revolutionary ideologies of the old regimes. Thus, the new model is linked to a post-revolutionary consciousness, if not yet in ideologies centering in civil society rather than the state. With popular, while popular sovereignty in the form of majority rule st still played an important role, a greater one in South Africa than elsewhere, uh, this was no longer conceived as embodied in a single institution or agent as in most revolutions. Equally, post-revolutionary ideas of reconciliation between former enemies representing important parts of the population and rule of law processes applied to the process itself uh, in, in the context of constitution making, very important. The historical influence of all these forms, the three I'm discussing, is undeniable. The American form has influenced French development, but in a paradoxical manner. I already spoke about how the uh, first uh, uh, theorists who used it failed, but uh, uh, one has to add an additional uh, element, unused in the practice of original constitution making, despite the term convention nationale, the convention formula involving double differentiation found its way into French amendment rules, almost every one of them, that in turn were almost never uh, used, similarly to the national convention formula in the US Article 5, uh, our amendment rule. In America, only the states were to have constitutional conventions, double differentiated as the theory required, and they did so frequently under a stable federal order. That order itself, the federal constitution had only very few amendments in 1787, mostly partial, while the 15 or so French constitutions, I hope I'm counting them right in number, uh, uh, have emerged through coups, revolutions, and semi-legal revisions of the revision, but never through convention or assembly of revision formulas. Latin American history with its many constitutions is generally similar to the French pattern. Though US institutions, including at times the convention, were widely imitated, the actual process of alteration was through coups, self-coups, and revolutions using plebiscitary imposition or in name at least sovereign assemblies. In the older case, I mentioned these already, Argentina under Perón, in the recent case of Venezuela under Chavez, the convention formula under the name Constituent Assembly Constituyente was used, but broke down and was turned into that of, a, of sovereign constituent assemblies. Yet there is a late single success story for the convention model. Under a different name, Parliamentary Sharat or Parliamentary Council at Kimze that drafted the highly successful German Basic Law and sent its product for ratification to the states, this model also came close to the American Federal Convention type. Interestingly, here stories seem to move in the reverse direction from constituent assembly to convention, if you take Weimar into account. The German liberals and Democrats, the constituent assembly of the French type uh, was most suitable, would have been most suitable to express the sovereignty of the political community. In the context of occupation and country division, however, they deemed that producing a constitution, even the name constitution, by a constituent assembly would have been inappropriate. The Grundgesetz was thus meant as a provisional constitution, an unredeemed promise that depending on interpretations of Article 146 linked to this case, uh, uh, could have implied both the constituent assemblies and multi-stage models. I don't know if Christoph knows uh, what the model, uh, formal model is implied by Article 146 because I certainly uh, have no way uh, of knowing. That last example too shows that the sovereign constituent assembly formula has been hegemonic for democratic constitution making, producing notable successes like India's constitution, total failures like Russia in 1918, but I think also Weimar, uh, 
and in part the Fourth French Republic, very short lifespans, and many, many cases in between. Very often, as I already mentioned, Lenin anticipated and hoped to imitate the Constituent Assembly turned out to be a mere instrument for whatever force was able to convene it. In spite of Lenin's own failure, many Constituent Assemblies in, Lenin, in Latin America and Africa confirmed his assumption. Finally, the Round Table II has now a real history with successes and failures. Leaving out the miracle of Spain that had no initial negotiations, Poland, Bulgaria, South Africa counted successes with workable final constitutions. The German Democratic Republic and Czechoslovakia were complete failures. I can discuss them in the discussion if you're interested. And Hungary's semi-failure, I used to always call it a partial success, but now things have changed. In the first two failures, in the case of the first two failures, the problem of the state, state making, proved impossible to solve. And as I stress in another work, there is no state, there's no constitution, which of course doesn't mean state in a narrow sense of a national uh, 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 polity. But something like a state, a polity is needed before you make a constitution. And even polity formation failed in uh, Czechoslovakia and uh, for the German Democratic uh, uh, Republic. Still, failure is failure. The application of the form in the externally imposed revolution of Iraq was probably also a failure that could still be perhaps redeemed. And we still don't know the outcome for Nepal, where the same form was applied after a legal break. Thus, on a purely empirical level, then, it would be difficult, if not impossible, to determine the superiority of any of the three forms that seem to be adopted always for situated and strategic reasons, first of all. So I turn to a brief set of structural and normative comparisons. So let's hope I know how to operate this. I do. On the purely, I'm sorry, analytically, it is relatively easy to depict the difference among the three great democratic types. And very schematically, I would emphasize seven dimensions. I hope it's still seven, uh, in which there are differences among them. This is the table. Uh, let, let me again comment on this table. I use the term double differentiation as, as introduced by Claude Klein in the past of Curry de Malberg to indicate uh, that the generally early legislature that stays in place does not engage in constitution making, while the main assembly or assemblies involved in making the constitution assume no other power in the state. Differentiation is single, where ordinary legislatures do not make the constitution, but the constituent assembly assumes legislative powers, often in the form of decree power, and often through its committees, executive ones. Again, Arnaud uh, Le Pilier has discussed this extensively. When the process involves two main stages of drafting, differentiation can take the double form in one stage and a single form in the other. Since a prior legislative assembly in this latter case is usually undemocratically put together, it is unlikely that it will retain its powers under a freely elected constitutional assembly, though the Americans tried to engineer such a thing for Iraq. It was also part of Condorcet's anticipation of the multi-stage model, but there, interestingly, which stage is single and which stage is double was reversed. As to the role of the final relevant body in the process, assembly or electorate, I call it passive, when it can only ratify or not ratify the constitutional draft, and active when it can either modify it or produce a new one. Here, levels of passivity are not the same. Referenda, though important in terms of what political scientists call their shadow on the previous process, are entirely passive. Ratifying conventions, a l'Américain, are relatively active, since they can and did suggest important amendments that the subsequent amending process can and did take very seriously the Bill of Rights was the American result. I do not exclude, finally, some combinations of referenda and ratifying conventions, as suggested by Ackerman and Fishkin, though these have historical examples or analogies only in the township ratification processes in revolutionary America. The place of sovereignty, or rather organ sovereignty in the model, is a less descriptive than theoretical issue. Thus, it belongs mostly to the normative differences among the models. Here I would like to say that the concept of sovereignty of the actors themselves and my assignment of type may be different. The actors may claim embodied popular sovereignty not only and invariably in the revolution constituent assemblies, but also in cases of the convention and the round table and express it in preambles. <clears throat> 
In my view, both the Federalist problem of duality and the multi-stage process make such a claim uh, at least highly misleading. At times, this is recognized, and it is, admittedly, and it is admitted in Madison's words that authority is one thing, the people, I'm quoting, the people spontaneously and universally moving toward their object is quite another. This was in Federalist 40. The admission of impossibility in the latter case bifurcates factual and, factual and legal meanings of sovereign powers on the one side and denies that the people can or should make constitutions in their collective or corporate or in an embodied capacity. I hope I can switch this off, but uh, I don't know how to do it. So please uh, don't look at it uh, too much anymore. Uh, this exclusion of embodiment leads to significant normative differences among the convention, constituent assembly, and round table that I will try to uh, evaluate to, through three two-by-two two juxtapositions. First, convention against constituent assembly. That's the two historical types. The critical comparison, to my knowledge, focusing on double differentiation, uh, has been attempted only by French writers, uh, especially uh, during the Third Republic. From the beginning, the fundamental argument in defense of conventions based on separation of powers has been that the always dangerous legislative power should not be allowed to transform its own parameters. And conversely, a constituent power should not become too closely identified with legislation if it is to establish a workable separation of powers. The argument for the convention is thus based on a distinction between constituant and constitué, constituent and constituted power, but in a version ultimately derived from the idea of Montesquieu. Even C.S. recognized this uh, uh, in his uh, year three uh, speech. With lots of caveats having to do with problem of representation, the defenders of the constituent assembly see the same distinction in terms of Rousseau, who in fact did not differentiate the legislative and constituent powers. The key here is popular sovereignty expressed not by Rousseau, but by his, some of his followers through electoral majorities. A constituent assembly elected by a majority supposedly expresses and embodies the will of the sovereign people and therefore cannot, like a convention, share power with any instance elected at a previous time. Legislative power, especially in the French theory, is also a supreme power. And if defined in terms of sovereignty, there cannot be two supreme powers in the state. The defenders of the convention model can respond by a different notion of popular national sovereignty, Carrie de Malberg's, one that cannot be embodied in a single person, a king, or institution, assembly, or group, the Parisian popular insurrection, without usurpation. From this point of view, a single stage, single assembly model, as repeatedly in France, runs the danger of just such a usurpation. Not only double differentiation, then, but the multi-stage character of the story of the Federal Convention, involving at least five instances, each of them having an influence in the draft, the Convention, Congress, state legislatures, the electorate of the states, and then freely elected state conventions, all this keeps the model from usurpation. Finally, Carl Schmitt has referred to constitution making in the form of practice in France in 1789 and 1793, as well as Weimar as sovereign dictatorship, sovereign dictature. I want to turn this against Schmidt himself, though. To him being in the state of, in the state of nature, liberated from all prior constraints, including the separation of powers, was central. While it is not entirely clear whether the dictatorship is exercised by the assemblies or by provisional revolutionary governments, as Birkenford has pointed out, and whether self-limitation can effectively block the road to what is ordinarily considered arbitrarily dictatorial rule, the elective affinity, I would call it not identity, of revolutionary constituent assemblies to dictatorship is thereby demonstrated. There is no such elective affinity for conventions that in spite of some of very specific illegalities operate on the established system of law, systems whose constitutions they replace without legal rupture. Constituent assembly versus round table. The debate between the two, these two models occurs in two dimensions, dictatorship versus democracy and radicalism versus conservatism. It obviously cannot be denied that the revolutionary constituent assembly is capable of a more radical break with the past, even taking Tocqueville's theory into account, if one focuses on the identity of the rulers 
and the direct beneficiaries of rule. An agreement with the latter reduces the extent of the break. This is a serious problem from many points of view, all having to do with, it, with an issue I will discuss next time, namely the conversion or preservation of illegitimate forms of earlier power. Nevertheless, the two-stage formula does allow a full change of regimes, usually already in the negotiated phase, whose legitimacy, I think, depends on this. While defenders of the old regimes, regime receive some concessions, these are, uh, in most cases, especially when they don't involve military uh, incumbents, uh, uh, guarantees re rather than conversions, as I just uh, described them. Admittedly, the price of the formula will be reform rather than revolution in some important domains, given the political focus of the regime change, most likely in the socioeconomic sphere. It is meanwhile questionable, however, whether revolution ever realized its socioeconomic goals of equality and justice, rather than generating alternative systems of inequality and injustice. On a constitutional level, Undoubtedly, the fact that the new regime does not have to be designed together with those attached to an old form of life is in part responsible. Important population segments politically opposed to the old regime, even the majority, can, therefore, can be therefore entirely left out of the construction of the new that will then make no, con no concessions to conservative life forms. The religious in France and the peasantry in Russia are two salient examples, and two civil wars were based on their resistance. The result is almost always, however, some resistance and new forms of re repression, anticipating resistance, and these are often long, terms, long term. The agencies that exercise it, or rather their members and constituencies, tend to gain important privileges and advantages also in the socioeconomic spheres. It is, I think, for this reason, in the dimension of democracy and dictatorship that the roundtable formula has its obvious superiority. Given the transition, uh, that in both uh, cases of revolution and round table is from authoritarian regimes, here constitutional democracy represents the fundamental break as against the establishment of a new dictatorship. What I mean is if you replace an old dictatorship by a new one, in a formal sense, uh, there's less of a break than when you replace an old dictatorship by a constitutional democracy. Revolution constitution making, therefore, in spite of the in spite of its democratic appearance in the Constitutional Assembly form, tends to, in fact, exercise dictatorship, as Marx, Lenin, and Schmidt equally maintained, and produces legitimacy problems that are difficult to resolve without authoritarian reversion. Supposedly temporary dictatorships often become permanent, as it is expressed by the formula of the dictatorship of the proletariat. The roundtable form avoids sovereign dictatorship, and as we will see next time, produces a variety of plausible answers in each of its stages to the problem of legitimation. Finally, with respect to revolutionary change that cannot be freed from the notion of foundational violence, I discussed that last time, the roundtable form achieved and justified a nonviolent form of change that can be represented as a democratic one. To be sure, the roundtable too cannot begin with democratic elections. But if, with Claude Lefort, we define democracy as the empty place of symbolic power, we should be able to see that the post-sovereign process of change, unlike revolution, has a chance of emptying that space of previous power holders and claims without a new claimant occupying it. The old ruling elite, elite loses its sovereignty, but its presence as a discussion partner, and indeed the framework of pluralistic negotiations it, itself, imply that the new forces cannot alone claim to speak in the name of the unified people. This means that in this paradigm, not only constitutionalism is applied, is applied to its own process of emergence, something quite important, but the same is true of democracy as well, helping to solve the problem of the beginning. To be sure, this is only a negative and formal solution that opens up rather than solves or closes the problem of legitimation. Convention and roundtable. It is on the question of sovereignty that the roundtable model can fully confirm to the implications of American practice, if not of theory, without the historical attachment to the antinomy of nationalism and federalism. Having adopted the idea of a second convention that, formally speaking, lost in America, the multi-stage model here has really come into its own. In the developed South African case, we see an equal number five of relevant actors as earlier in America, the roundtable, the old parliament, uh, 
the electorate, the Constitutional Assembly, and the Constitutional Court. More importantly, in comparison to the Convention with its one drafting agents, three of these agencies play an important role in drafting and design, and none of them can claim fully sovereign or unlimited status. It is important to stress the transformation of the problem of sovereignty in the roundtable model. The American understanding of constitution making, as the preamble to the Constitution shows, I already referred to this, was in the name of the sovereign people. In the conflict between federal and national conceptions, it was difficult to find the identity of the, of the body fully representing the people. The assembly where their representatives met and did all the drafting, the federal convention or the federal convention, uh, which had the final, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the federal convention or the bodies that had the final word, the state conventions. In this sense, the sovereignty of the whole was not fully embodied in any instance, even at the level of constitution making, and Hannah Arendt's judgment concerning the banishment of Oregon sovereignty can be partially upheld. Yet, the appeal to the sovereign as the author of the constitution meant that Oregon sovereignty could not be reliably banished from the American scene. In different historical contexts, as we see it from Ackerman's conception, and a couple of cases I illustrated last time, and especially transported, transported elsewhere to more centralized setting, settings, the American conception allows the revival of the idea that a constitution should be the work of a unified popular sovereign represented or unified by an organ of the state. The multi-stage roundtable formula that divides the work of discussion, drafting, and enactment goes a step further in the direction where organ sovereignty is banished, where the place of the king really becomes an empty place. As argued last time, the whole history of the American model of constitution making and the difficulty of applying it elsewhere suggests exceptionalism, by no means escaped by Hannah Arendt's brilliant analysis. Condorcet already noted the problem, calling the American transition one from a free to a more free constitution, and as he noticed for France, and I would say generally, such is not the context of original constitution making. In most places, well-functioning republic institutions are not available for the purposes of double differentiation. Moreover, as Carl Schmitt noted as well, in America, the making of a new type of federation and, a constitu and constitution making coincided, more or less. This not only made difficult, as Carl Schmitt stressed, the clear decision of the constituent power about the form of the state, but also provided a stabilizing framework for multiple institutions that elsewhere had a tendency to revert to a duality of power. Thus, the model had always the greatest chance of success where the relevant individual states were embedded in larger federations or where the creation of federal institutions occurred in the context of stable unit constitutions. This I argued last time. Contrary to that, the roundtable process of constitution making not only makes more explicit the critique of sovereignty latent in the American convention model, but makes the achievement of overcoming organ sovereignty in constitution making less exceptional. Neither pre-existing republics nor federations of any kind are required, and there is no need to create federal states when using this model. At the very least, it should be said that the ability to institute democratizing and its second stage democratic process of constitution making regulated by constitutional rules where there's neither democracy nor constitutionalism dramatically reduces the exceptional nature of the circumstances where post-organ sovereign conceptions can apply. Uh, this means that the circle of authoritarian rule and dictatorship can be broken by a method that does not itself risk a new, new authoritarian form. But this is not yet the full normative advantage of, over the convention form. That superiority I see in terms of the already stated objection at the federal convention, renewed by the anti-federalists, that it is impermissible to give the last enacting instance representing the people a simple yes or no choice in, in the case of complex packages. In other words, the elected body should be allowed to make their positive constitutional input. Extended, this means that the societal discussion in which, for example, the Federalist Papers were one among the most important publications should have been allowed to have an effect on the outcome beyond getting the assent of the people who preferred more things in the document, who preferred more things in the document than they actually rejected. The second convention idea, we discussed this last time, linked to that of an interim constitution was an important one from the point of view of democratic theory, 
whatever the reasons for its formal non-adoption non at that time. In the new model, the interim constitution and the public discussion around it and the elections for the constitutional assembly provide the context for making new inputs into the final document. Thus, there's both learning with respect to the convention model and the institutionalization of learning within the new model itself. The non-sovereign constitutional assembly has a chance to make fruitful the results of the latter learning through its own discussions, the work of its committees, the inputs of external participants, and uniquely but importantly, in South Africa, the certification process and the relevant redrafting. All this represents tremendous democratic gains over the passive ratification in referenda that becomes unnecessary for the new model. In conclusion, I'd like to speak about the synthetic nature of the new model. The fact that the roundtable realizes the lost aspirations of some important architects of both the convention and the constituent assembly models already indicates its synthetic nature. Of course, the synthesis I have in mind was entirely unintended. The participants, as far as I can tell, paid no attention to the convention form and on the democratic side abandoned the constituent assembly formula first and foremost for strategic reasons. Thus, what follows now has a reconstructive nature focusing on structural and normative features really entirely clear to the participants themselves. It has been rightly remarked by Jon Elster that the round table is something like a convention, and one could equally say that the Constitutional Assembly paired with it resembles in some respects the Constituent Assembly of the classical French model. As to the first point, neither the round table nor a convention like that of Philadelphia are known to the previous constitutions. Both only recommend, but do so in ways that become a constitution. But the differences should be noted as well. The round table does not have electoral legitimacy, even one with a long chain like the federal convention whose members were delegated by elected state legislatures. Of course, other conventions in the states were even elected. By its nature, the round table cannot be an elected body, since its task is to establish for the first time the rules by which free and fair elections can take place. Its legitimacy, its legitimacy problems are greater, a point easily lost in South Africa, where the charismatic ANC leadership had such a prestige among the majority of the population. And this leads to the next difference already noted. The round table's constitution is only an interim one, and it leads to very serious legitimacy problems where, as in Hungary, as we now have seen, it tends to become permanent. The convention produces a final constitution that the ratifying instances can only accept or reject. The similarity of the constitutional and constituent assemblies is also significant. Both are democratically elected, at least after the second French prototype. Neither is doubly differentiated on the legislative level. It is true that the South African Constitutional Assembly was technically the two members, the two chambers of parliament meeting together, while separately they could meet as a regular legislature. But this is a very low degree of, of double differentiation, anticipated in part by the great Indian Constituent Assembly, meeting sometime under one set of rules as parliament, and other times under other rules as the Constituent Assembly. Nevertheless, the differences already mentioned are equally important. The Constitutional Assembly of the Round Table model is not sovereign, operates under constitutional rules, not under its own disposition, and is accountable for adhering to these rules and in South Africa to substantive principles to another body from which it is indeed sharply differentiated, the Constitutional Court. While the latter subordination of the constituant to the constitué has been clearly practiced only in South Africa, in the case of procedural violations, at least of amendment rules, a similar logic would necessarily have, to have come into play if relevant. It wasn't in most other roundtable countries. Thus, the constitutional court created by the interim constitution of this model becomes a substitute for double differentiation that cannot be accomplished between the legislative and constituent powers. Let me really conclude now. As a synthetic, multi-stage form, the round table combines many of the advantages, especially the creative as aspects of conventions and constituent assemblies, but escaping the dangers of both inherent in the remaining links to organ sovereignty. 
It is this synthetic character that allows the form to make more radical change in regimes than the American Convention form without the danger of revolution dictatorship inherent in constituent assemblies. Like the convention, but more consistently, it replaces a model of sovereign constitution making with an affinity for dictatorship with another where the imagined will of the people is expressed only through a variety of instances, none of them can being able to claim full identity with or embodiment incarnation of the popular sovereign. But like the constituent assembly, it culminates in a state of democratic constitution making where the elected instances really make a new constitution. Moreover, the rules of this election are negotiated rather than imposed. And all these elements are linked together by a new type of constitutional framework enshrined in an enforceable interim constitution. The post-sovereign multi-stage roundtable paradigm, though an ideal type, is also a coherent framework without, with mutually reinforcing parts. Especially the completion of the last stage after free elections can be decisive, as I will try to show with the failed Hungarian case that will be a big part of my discussion two weeks from now. But there is one part of the overall framework that I will argue is detachable from it. It is its scheme of the production of legitimacy. Two weeks from now, and to some extent next week, I will also argue that projects of radical reform and revolution will also fail if they do not satisfy the legitimacy deficits of which it was the post-sovereign model that has made us fully conscious. Next week, however, I will discuss the empirical conditions conducing to establish constitutional constitutions. I will present relevant social scientific theories and reconsider the post-sovereign method its origins and normative assumptions in their context. This discussion will show the implicit reliance of even rational choice social science on concepts of legitimation, that the post-sovereign method, less certain of its legitimacy than revolution and reform, has forced us to confront. Thank you very much. <laughs>